Hello, everyone. So, can I have your attention? We're going to go through a series of things today. Almost, we're going to be done with the semester, I think, today. We'll see what happens, OK? So first thing that uh, I want to talk about, you know I'll, I'll, uh, uh, those chatterboxes, please. Uh, listen today because we have lots of important stuff to cover. OK? All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know who you are. So if you want to write something on a screen, what do you do? You write, say, um, see out, hello there, right? And what did we say the see out, that see out is? We said see out is actually an object that is instantiated. It's a global object. It's an instance of O stream that is created in uh, O stream header file. And, and where you include it, you have access to the, to the object. And therefore, you use the insertion operator overload to print different things that you have, right? OK. Now, let me actually do something here. Uh, when you when you look at the hierarchy of the when you look at the hierarchy of the uh, input output system of C++, the grandparent is called iOS. So all the good stuff, all the settings, all the things, you know how you like do iOS fix, iOS this with scope resolution, you write that. Those iOS stuff, they are all things that are shared between all input output systems. The iStream and OStream are two classes with deleted constructors. Not deleted, hidden like private constructors. You cannot actually instantiate them. iStream and OStream, you cannot instantiate them. Why? Because they only want to instantiate one entity of it. So C in and C out are those two. So C in and C out are actually instances of iStream and OStream, but you cannot copy them. You cannot instantiate them. Why? Because you only have one console. It doesn't make sense to have two C outs. Okay? You print on a console, it goes on console. You cannot have two of them, right? That's why it's a global entity and you have it everywhere. But iStream has a child called ifstream and ostream has a child called ofstream. ifstream and ofstream and those two, they actually, those two actually have a child. that is called fstream. I'm not going to even try to write it in here, OK? So fstream is, is child of ifstream and, if and ofstream. fstream is a class that has, a, this is called multiple inheritance, OK, that we have in C++, um, which you're not going to learn this semester, next semester. But just know that iOS has iStream and OStream. iStream and OStream are inherited in iFStream and OFStream, and they are joined together in a class called FStream. OK? What is iFStream? iFStream is essentially iStream, but for a file. OFStream is OStream for a file. You already know what inheritance is. When you inherit something, Everything that you have in that entity comes and more, right? That's how it is. Now, the question arises like, OK, if I have an object called OStream, do I have an object for OIFStream and OFStream? The answer is, that doesn't make sense. The answer is, I have to remove that thing from there. Uh, just give me a second. Clear, clear, clear. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So what I was saying was, uh, it doesn't make sense because you can have many files on your hard drive. 
So it doesn't make sense to create a global instance like C out for it. Therefore, IF stream and OF stream are entities that you have to actually instantiate based on what type of a file you want to deal with. Now, if you wanted to design, say, OF stream, if you wanted to design OF streams constructor, what would you, what you would have passed to it? Remember, you are creating a class that is supposed to represent a file. If you want to create a class that represents a file, what you would give to its constructor? What do you think? The file name. Yeah, the file name. URL is web. We are talking hard disk. So path. OK, file path. OK, so, so the, the name of the file, essentially. So let's try it. Let's actually do OF stream. Oh, and all these things are in a header file called fstream. So you have to include that. I have to, you have to say include fstream. So fstream holds ifstream, ofstream, and fstream. All three classes are in here. Okay? So now, if I want to create it, so I'm going to call it, say, so, so I'm going to say ofstream. It's the child of ostream. It's essentially like C out, right? So I'm going to call it. Um, my file, okay? And I pass a name to it. I'm going to call it hello.txt, okay? Now, I don't know if you actually worked on files in, how many people actually heard about files in IPC 144? Hands up. Okay. So, um, probably you were a uh, Cameron's student then. Anyways, so files, as you know, they have to get open before you can do anything with them. So any file you want to deal with, you have to open the file. It's exactly like a box. You open it. Can I? You, wow, this is a file, lots of data in it. Anyways, so you open it. <laughs> this one doesn't open. Oh. File. Yes, you open it, you put stuff in it, you close it. It's like files are literally that. You open or you open. <laughs> take something out and then you close it. Okay? So, <laughs> yeah, you got, the, you got the picture, right? All right. Okay. So, that we have in C. In C, you actually do F, uh, F open, and you open a file, right? Then you do F close, you close the file, and you create a handle called file, correct? In C++, I have an object. Now, if you wanted to open a file, where was a good place to open a file in? You have to always open the file once before you can do anything with the file, right? So where is a good place to open the file? In the constructor, correct? And if you wanted to close a file, where is a good place to close the file so to make sure everything is saved in our drive? Destructor. That's what they did. Done. I don't have to open anything. I don't have to close anything. Because it is in a constructor, and it just makes sense. Now, instead of writing C out hello there, I can, because it's a child of C out, it works exactly that way. I can say my file. Now, if I run this beautiful program of mine, three years later when it runs, four years later, five years later, and when it executes, this is the output, which is nothing. Why? Because it wrote it in a file. Now, if I actually open it, I'm going to see there is a hello.txt. And here's hello.txt. So he actually wrote it in a file. As simple and easy as that. Are we OK with this? So there is no need for me to teach you anything more than what you know about files. If I want to do reg normal read and write text files from a file, if you want to read anything from a file, if it's an integer, you know how to read an integer, right? It's CN, right? So create an IF stream instance and put the name of the file. And the good thing about the file is that 
unlike human beings, it's not unpredictable. Human beings are stupid and dumb. They sit behind the thing, you say enter your name instead of 20, they actually write T-W-E-N-T-Y, right? So you have to tell them, hey, wrong, what are you doing? Try again, you idiot. You have to keep talking to them. With a file, you don't do that. You look at the format of the file, oh, the first one is an integer. Then there's a comma, then there's a string, then there's a comma, then there's a double. Then, so you know exactly what the format is. So you exactly plan what you want to read. And all you need to do is to check your iStream for, what do you check for C in to see if it's fail? There you go. Because C in has fail, that has fail. It's a child. So you simply check for fail. And if it fails, you don't need to print any message. All you need to say that the file is corrupted, fix it. Done. And if everything goes well, by the time C in fails, it's the time at, that is at the end of the file. That's when it fails, right? It hits end of, end of the file. So it's very simple and easy. It's actually much easier to deal with files than deal with human beings because with files, you see the plan, you plan for it, you write a program, it reads the file for you. For example, I have my hello.txt, and that hello.txt has hello there in there, correct? So. I'm going to write over here, save as, oh, save as, alt F A. save as, then I'm going to say over oh, here, this, this dialog box is way too big, just a second. All right. So I'm going to call it uh, O stream 1, actually 0, 01 O stream, 0, 01 O stream dot CPP, and we just put that one over there for you. And I don't know why it keeps giving me that exception thingy. They, they, they have to fix that. Hopefully, they will do it soon. So instead of IF stream, I'm going to make it OF stream. I'm going to make it IF stream. All right? So I have IF stream now. And in here, I'm going to create a string. I'm going to say character str. And I'm going to put over here 80 characters. And then in here, I'm going to say, my file exactly like C in, and I'm going to put it in SDR. And remember, this is your file. Right? Now I can say over here, C out, SDR, and L. And what is going to get printed now? It, oh, what does it going to print? One more time. Hello there? Now use your brain and tell me what it's going to print. It's a child of C in. Just close your eyes and imagine that somebody's sitting at the keyboard. You are saying C in into a string, and the person is typing hello, space, there, exclamation mark, enter. What's going to go into SDR? Hello. Ah, got you there. Why hello? Because space is a delimiter for C in, correct? It works exactly like C in. There's no magic. Because you see that there over there, it doesn't mean that it's going to read it. If you want to actually read the second one, you have to do it again. So you have to have the, the reading happening again. I have to do it like this. Seriously? Copying is taking that long? All right. You see? Now I'm saying read it and read it. So it's going to read the first one, go to new line, read the second one, it's going to print it. And if I run it, it's going to work exactly as what, what we expect. So we're going to have hello, new line there. All right? Now, can somebody tell me if I wanted to read? So in here, I'm going to say again, 0, 2, uh, iStream.cpp, and bring the other one up again. OK. Now, if I want to read the whole line, what can I write? No? Nope. Get line. Yeah, get line. I can do get line. So let's actually split the window first. Then you have to write a loop, character by character. We'll, we'll, we'll go through it. Anyways, so now, so now if I want to read the whole thing, 
all I need to do is to get line, to do get line. So I have to say dot get line into SDR up to 80 characters and stop at what? New line. And now I can have one SDR printed and that's going to be hello there. Correct? So it works exactly right like C in with no difference. Are we okay with this? Okay. So let's say I have a file. Let's say I've, I've got to call it data.txt. And in my data.txt, I'm going to write a phone number, 416-555-6789. And then after that, I'm going to put a comma. Then I'm going to put, what do I put? No, no. Uh, and the name. OK, so uh, I don't know, Homer Simpson. OK? And then I'll go to new line, and it's going to be 416. Actually, let's make it a little more. So, so I'm going to put the area code separate, OK? And then I'm going to have uh, 674, for you? 647? 647, 555, 1234. And this is going to be who? Jane Doe, OK? So if I want to have something like this, now let's say what I have over here is this. Let's say I actually have a structure. Uh, let's make it a class. Who cares? Class, and I'm going to call it uh, uh, phone number or phone record. So a phone record has an integer area code, and it has an integer number, right? And Let's say it has a character name that is maximum 81 characters, whatever, 80 characters, right? OK? Now, if I want to, let's uh, make it easy first, uh, or no, should I? Yeah. So um, in here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to display this thing. I'm just going to try to display this. So I'm going to have uh, public over here, so everything's going to be uh, Initialize, so uh, let's have a, oh, that's a phone record, by the way, not a phone read. That's too big of a C. So phone record, and in phone record, I'm going to set the area code to zero, and number, number to uh, zero again. And I'm going to set uh, name 0 to 0. OK, an empty phone record, right? Now let's try to display it. How do we display it? O stream, um, O stream um, reference uh, display. And I'm going to display it exactly like that. So I'm going to say display. And in here, I'm going to say O stream reference OS, and I'm going to go OS, um, or oh, using namespace SD should go up. OS area dash uh, number, or uh, yeah, number. And then I'm going to put a comma, the name. So that displays it and return that OS. Now, this is O stream. Remember that. It's a reference of O stream. 
Are we okay with this? All right. First, let's do it cheesy way, okay? I'm going to make this struct in here. First, I'm going to do it cheesy way. So I made that a struct. There is no public need that everything's public struct. And just for ease of use, let that public be. In here, I'm going to overload the O stream. So you know O stream reference operator uh, to print it with C out, right? So at left side is O stream reference OS. If anybody in final exam can't do the overload seriously, I'm going to come and do something bad, OK? I don't know, beat you up or something. Okay? It's like I've done this like 55,000 times. It's like blueprint identical in every single class. Please get a mark with this, full mark. Okay? And then const. So what, what mistake I made over here? Did I make a mistake? <laughs> Seriously. Const, uh, const phone record. Reference uh, phone record. And in here, I have to say return phone record dot display. I can't. Why? Because display is not constant. Always uh, look at the things you're writing to make sure everything's OK. So OS. So that's going to print it out. Now, if I want to read that thing, so the, the, let me just put the, put the data over here and actually save it too. OK? So if I want to read that from a file, how do I read it? Um, I have to say, um, I have to say my, my file, oh, come on. I have to say my file, and I put it right into, oh, I have to, I need a phone record first. So phone record um, R for the record, okay? So I'm going to say R dot area, right? So that's the first thing that I'm reading. Then I have, you want to change that to a dash? Let's change that to a dash just to, you know, just for fun, okay? So now, if I do that, when I, now, uh, please, please uh, pay close attention to this one, and let's, let's do C out, C out uh, R over here, because we overloaded it. It can actually print it. There is no problem. Okay, now please take a look at this. Now, when I say my file, and I put it R dash area, what's going to go in there when it's reading? It's going to go 416 and stop at dash, correct? That's what's going to happen, right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the record. So the first one is read. Beautiful. Now I need to say my file dot ignore. Ignore one character. Because that's what I do in CA, right? So the dash is ignored now. Are we OK with this? So I read the 416. I passed the dash. Now I read to read the number, right? So I'll read the number. So I'm going to say uh, my file. Uh, what do I do? Um, R dot number, right? Number, if I can type it. There you go. And now I got to the comma, correct? So I just ignore another one. One more. So my file dot ignore. Now, if they ask you, please validate the delimiters. Instead of ignore, you do my file dot get. You get one character. You check, make sure it's a dash. If it's not a dash, you stop. OK? Whatever. But we are not doing that. OK? So it comes right down over here. And actually, let's do all these things in a function. So in here, I'm going to say uh, read void read phone record and let's make it a boolean i'm doing it crappy okay bad awful version of it okay but we'll fix it later on okay in here i'm reading a phone record so uh, i'm gonna have a reference okay phone reference that's phone record and what else do i need? i need to pass the file to it so that's an of stream that i have to pass to it the one that i want to write read from so that's my file um, and and I'll do all the good things that I'm doing in here, right in there. So I'm gonna. Yes, yes. I have, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Big time, thank you. All right. So I have stream, 
And these are, so instead of my file, I'm going to say file, 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 file. And this is PR, not R. And because it's a reference, it's going to affect whatever it's reading, right? Same thing, I just brought it into a function to look cool, OK? Are we OK down to here? Pardon me? Oh, we're going to return a Boolean, right? Because we don't know what it is for now, for now I'm going to say return true. I'll, I'll find out what I'm going to do later, OK? So I got the number. Now I got the number. I have to read the name, correct? So what I'm going to do, one is ignored. Now I have to say uh, cn, uh, sorry, uh, file. See, I'm even saying cn. Uh, file dot get line, correct? Uh, into uh, pr dot name up to 80 characters and stop at backslash n, correct? Are we okay with this? All right, now, if file dot fail, what does it mean? I have to return true, correct? So in here, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna say over here, uh, what do I say? I'm gonna say Boolean result, I'm gonna, uh, let's be optimistic. So I'm going to say true, and in here I'm going to return the result. And then I'm going to say if it failed, make it false. So the result will be false, and I'm going to, and I'm going to clear the, the file, file.clear, in case I want to do something with it later. Uh. Exactly CN. Just replace those files with CN. Are we OK with this? All right. Now that I have this, what do I do? I, instead of hello.txt, I'll make it data.txt. And I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say what? I'm going to say uh, read record, read phone record. I'm going to pass the, PR, uh, the, the R to it and my file. Let's see if it works. Before Jane? Oh, because you forgot how getLine works. Oh, getLine gets the space? I don't know. Let's try. We'll find out. If it gets the space, does, it, does, does getLine skip the spaces until it hits the first one? I, quite frankly, I don't remember. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, we'll fix it. Easy. That's what programming is, right? I don't remember. Seriously, I don't remember it. I don't know if it actually ignores the leading spaces or not. So if I, so when I'm printing over here, if I'm going to have two spaces, so to check it, let's do it like this. I'm going to actually put parentheses around name to see if it's going to be a uh, space or not, right? So I'm going to put the name in parentheses to see, just to make sure. So let's run it. And three years later, when it runs, four years later, five years later, actually it reads this space. You're right. OK? So we have two choices over here. OK? What are the choices? Choice number one, contact tech support. Say, hey, you have an extra space over there. It's supposed to be comma separated. Bring all the names and make it right. OK? So which means, which means uh, change the data file to our needs. Because it's not supposed, human is not supposed to read that. Your program is supposed to read it. So I'll fix the data file. If we did it, we had to ignore another character. OK? You had to ignore two characters. Yes? What do you mean? The three argument constructor to store the data into the class. Three argument constructor. No, no, no. It's just a, it's just a uh, structure now. It's just a structure. I'm not, I'm not doing anything with it. OK? So, so are we OK down to here? All right. So now if I run it, probably it's going to be OK. Control F5. Now yeah, I have the Homer Simpson thingy over happening over here, right? So let's try something else and see what happens next. So what I'm going to do here is this. I'm going to say, uh, let's put this in a loop and see what happens. So I'm going to say, uh, uh, while. Oh, sorry about that. Where did I go? Here, OK. While in 
and I need an extra extra parentheses over there. All right. And I have two names. I write the file. As simple as that. See, it's like three seconds programming. There's just there's not not much in it to go through. That was a crappy way of doing it because I had the function outside, right? I had, but if I if I actually wanted to write this properly, what would have I done? I actually would write a reader. So I would say, oh, I stream reference read, I stream reference is. And copy all this. I don't need to check for failure over there because if it fails, I'll find out. Uh, so I'll put it like that. So this one's going to be is. 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 I should have done a search and replace, but I didn't. Is. And. Um, remove the thing because they're all local. And then at the end, return the IS. All right, that's the read, standard read that we were doing, right? And, and I could simply, sorry, I'm lazy because it looks exactly like this one. I'm just going to copy that and paste. So this is IS. Operator goes right. IS and I stream. And this is PR read. Are we good? Oh, that's IS. Correct? So I should have saved it. I didn't save it, did I? Good. Give me two seconds. Control A. Copy, copy, and I'm going to close it. Don't save. I want the old one first and then fix it to the new one. So that's 03 uh, iStream.cpp. And now I'm going to open this one, Control A and Control V. So now it should be what I wrote. Yeah. So now I don't need this thing anymore. Now that I have that, what I can do is as simple as this. Instead of that, I'm going to say do. Oh, that's not so. Do. In here, I'm going to say my file into R, and in here I'm going to say while my file, right? Because we know Boolean is overloaded. If it fails, it returns false. So while it's good, go. We'll see that something bad's going to happen now, but it's OK. You'll see what, what happens. So now if I run it, it essentially runs the exact same thing. But I have a question. What the heck? I just did I stream. Didn't I? This is IF stream. What happened? Like, and wait a minute, it actually read it. Of course, I have an extra garbage over there, but it read it. How did that happen? First of all, let's fix this because it's failing and then printing the failure. I have to have this over here. I have to actually say over here, if my file see out, OK? So now if I print it, it's going to actually show it. But but question is that, how did it work? I didn't do IF stream. It was I stream. How did it work? Inheritance, virtuals. Remember, IF stream is the child of I stream. And because reading and all the stuff that you have in iStream is virtual, always the latest version will be called, which means 
if you pass an IF stream to an I stream, it will work just fine. It just calls the latest versions. And the latest versions of those things are the ones that are reading from the file. We are in a clear. Are we OK with this? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? So that's files. Done. Finished. We don't need to know anything else about files. Because you already know how to work with C in and C out, thanks to object orientation, I don't need to teach you anything. If you want a file, go if stream. If you want to go if go of stream. I'm just going to give you one extra thing that is optional. You don't need to know, but I'm just going to let you know. Uh, it's, it's, uh, but it's cool to know that you can actually have something for read and write. I, uh, so you can have f stream. And so, so you, there are so many different, because it's a file, you don't want to always read it at, at the beginning, right? Sometimes you want to add stuff to it. Sometimes you want to. Uh, Write something in the middle. Sometimes you want to clean the, up the file, delete the file, and do something new. All these things can be done with the second argument of opening this. So first of all, I could have written over here f stream, OK? And in here mention, I want iOS input. So this and that. So f stream of mine now is the one that has both of those objects in its belly. Now I can say, I want f stream for input. It will still work with absolutely no difference. It works, and everything's going to be fine. So it's going to actually read it and write it from it, no problem. The only difference is that I could have actually written stuff into it, too. So I could do the reading and then write afterwards into a file by adding more options here. And the options are separated with a bar, OK? That bar thingy, you don't know what it is now. You'll learn in OP345. That bar thingy is a bitwise OR operator. It ORs the bits of the thing. Too rich for your blood? Don't care. Don't Just remember, you can separate the options with a bar, OK? So now if I wanted to, for, for it to do output over there too, or if I want to write something, I want to be added to the end. I can say iOS append, append to the end of it, OK? I can say iOS trunk. If you do that, there is no point of reading from it because it deletes it when it opens it. It nullifies the file, empties the file at the moment of opening. So you can do all these stuff with it and have one thing, one file open for both actions, read and write. And you can write it in many different places in the file, which I'm not going to go through it. So you can actually say, OK, go to byte 52 and start writing from here now. So you can do all these manipulations. Because we are doing plain text files, we don't need to do that. OK? But where you can find those things, they are all in here. If you come down, it says optional. It is not optional. It's, you have to know it. OK? Now, what I mean like that, that these parts, it, it, it puts all of them as optional manipulators. Like, please read those things. What optional? Do that. At all these refinements, I'm not going to teach. I'm not going to sit over here and tell you how to do left, left justified, how to do right justified. Go read it yourself. It's, they're easy stuff, OK? You just have to see how it works. And you have done it already many times. So read those things. I'm not going to waste your time with those. Precision, all the things, examples are there. Like I can just copy, paste, and talk about it, but why do we waste time? All right? This is what I was talking about. Give me two seconds. Uh, oh, you're stretching. No, I thought you were actually asking a question. OK. Where is it? Did I pass it? I think I did pass it. Yeah, file stream class is optional. No, it's not optional. You have to read that. That's very, very mandatory. OK? So these things you have to read. OK? Read those things. But for if stream and of stream, you don't need to use f stream. All you need to deal with is text files. So with if stream and of stream, you can do whatever you want to do down to this point. But what are good to know are these. <coughs> So
So if you want to open for, for opening is iOS in. Out is for writing out. Append is to append. Truncate is to uh, empty the file at the moment of opening. ATE means initially right at the end, but you can always come back. If you open as a pen, no matter what you do, it always adds to the end. It's good for log files. If you want to create a log file and create logs of stuff, you open it as a pen because it doesn't delete the old one and it just adds to the end. ATE, at the moment of opening, it writes at the end, but you can always using the FSeq and GSeq. Uh, you'll, you'll see, like GSeq and uh, PC, uh, get and put, yeah. With, with, with GSeq and, and PSeq, you can. G is for getting, P is for putting. G seek, you can say which one. So if you say G seek 32, it means the next byte that's going to get read will be 32. I'm just letting you know. You don't need to know it. These are too rich for, for your blood at this moment. But just know it. Seek, look for seek uh, functions. P seek or G seek. So P seek is for putting. G seek is for getting. Okay? Not for forgetting. For, for, pause, getting. All right? All right. So if now most usual combinations of things open for reading and writing, so it's iOS in, iOS out. Open for reading and overwriting, it's in, out, and truncate. Open for appending and reading, in, out, and append. And open for overwriting is out and trunk. OK? So these are the things that, that is good to know. And the default, as you saw, IF stream is always to read, and OF stream is the output, F stream is in and out. Okay? So if you don't mention anything and you simply say F stream, it's in and out. Okay? And that's all. So these are all the so second argument, and they are all separated with bar. Bar is an operator, it's, it's a bitwise OR. You don't need to know what the heck that means, but just know if you want to have multiple different things to be done at the same time. That's how you do it. File are done. Any questions? Any questions one? Any questions two? Break? If for some unknown reason I'm nuts enough to want to create functions for adding two things, that's how I would do it, right? Int add int x, int y, return x plus y, double add, double x, y, return x plus y, right? Because I overloaded the two, uh, the two, it would work for values, so it becomes seamless. So I can put 21 and 23 over here. Ooh, I'm afraid of that. 21 and 23 over here, I can simply say add, and it picks up the right version and calls the right version for the add function. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay too? Everybody's okay with what I wrote, right? So that I can actually extend it to other stuff too. I could actually, I could actually have a class, okay? And that class of mine has operator plus overloaded and works with C out, and I could have a very similar thing over here for that class and the function created, which means that's going to be that, and I can have a function created like this, correct? So I'm saying container at container x, container y, x plus y. And because container has implemented the plus operator over here for me, oh, not there, here for me, right? And it works properly with that, and it has no, me no, no dynamic memory allocation. So if I actually say k add ij, and i and j of mine are actually container instances, see, line number 46, 48, 50, if you didn't know what the types are, you couldn't say which one is what, right? They are identical. 
Now take a look at take a look at the functions by themselves. Aren't the functions suspiciously similar? Right? When you look at the functions, they like you can literally remove the types, right? And they're identical. Correct? Okay, so whenever you have this type of scenario, you wished you could actually hire someone, give them the logic, and tell them, okay, whenever I use the double, please create a double, just replace the types with double. If it's an employee, just do the employee and replace the types with an employee. If it's a container, just replace it and do it with a container. So I wished that I could actually do something like this, just say, okay, this is type, type, and type, and remove the rest of the stuff, right? And just call someone, say, please take a look at the functions that are called, and see what type of a thing is called, and generate the function automatically for me. So if I say add A or B, look at A or B. A or B are int, so I'm going to create int, add int, x, int, y, right? If it's double, I'm going to put double. C++ does that. So essentially, you can tell to C++, hey, I have a template over here for you to fill. The template of mine has a type name that is called type in here. You could name it anything. And C++ will automatically do what I exactly told you now, which means it's going to look at the signature of the function calls and at compile time generate the function for you and save it in your binary. So when you actually call the function, you have the function ready for you. Are we okay with this? Now, this is an amazing type of polymorphism. This polymorphism rules because you don't even have a function. If I do not call any ads, nothing's going to get generated. I wrote the code, but because I never called it, even the binary of the function will not get created because it's never used. Compiler will not create it. You create a template with no use. If you use it, though, it's going to actually generate it. There is one problem with this. Problem is that when we create functions, what do we do? We put the prototypes in the header file and the body of the function in the CPP file, correct? Please recall, when you actually, when you actually compile the code, compiler at every pass only sees the header files and the CPP file it's compiling, correct? It doesn't see other CPP files. Who sees other CPP files? The linker. Remember that? Long time ago in the galaxy, far, far away. If you don't remember, I'll bring up the picture again. All right? Did I, did I even met? Did I talk about compilers? Okay. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So every single, because of that fact, templates must be fully accessible to compiler at the moment of compilation. You cannot put their body in another CPP file. If you do that, at the moment of compilation, compiler doesn't know what the body of the function is to create it for you. Because of this fact, templates, unlike other code, must fully exist in header files. There is no CPP files for a, for, a func for a template. Any type of template that you create, the whole thing must be in the header file. So the compiler can have the whole picture to generate the binary for you at compile time. You cannot have, like if I wanted to have an add module, I could not have an add CPP and an add header file. Put the add prototype in the header file and the body in the CPP file. Because at the moment of compilation, the only thing that compiler would have seen would be this. And from that, compiler can't tell you how to build the add. 
You follow what I'm saying? Are we okay with this? Remember, the whole thing, the whole template must exist in the header file. So that's a, a good example. So now if I actually run this program, you will see that everything works perfectly with it. Everything works perfectly with it, and the container, and the double, and the integer are all added. You see that? That's called magic. We'll call that polymorphism to the bone. Yes? Three separate functions, or just one function that adapts to like the Completely three separate functions. It literally is as if you hired a programmer to rewrite each function for the call that you have. Okay? And C++ relies a lot on templates. A heads up for next semester. We have, have you think, like, have you heard that commercial says there's an app for it? Anything you think of, there is a template for it in C++. Anything you think of, there is a template for it. You just need to know how to use it. Yes, sir. So uh, with what you just say, does it mean that there's a template for different type as well? What do you mean by, by different type? Let's say if you want to add an ink to a double, obviously you need to cast an ink to the, but the double first, right? Oh, you can template, I, I just showed you that very easy version of it. You can have so many different types. You can have template, type one, type two, type name one, type name two, three, four, and have five different things. You can even have integers over there. Like say, I want, an int I want the second one to be, it's a very broad way. I just showed, like, I just showed you the tip of the, the needle. There are, like, there, are, there are so many things in there that have to get covered that we are not going to do it now. Okay? Are we okay down to here? Are we okay? Now, <clears throat> let me pause. Yes, sir. And the question is? So can we create a template to for the like overload operators, like plus, minus, and minus? You can create a template for anything. Anything? Yeah. The, this is function templates. So this is templates when you're a bad person and you're creating functions. So first we teach that, and then there's class templates. When you create a class templates, then sky is the limit. Anything you did in a class, you can do it as a, as a template. Uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate. Give me two seconds, I'll demonstrate. First, let's make it a little, a little tricksy over here. So. You all remember bubble sort from IPC 144, right? Sure. Okay, at least one person remembers. Okay, so that's the bubble sort, right? So you, you do a bubble sort, in, in the, in, and I'm printing stuff. So I have a bubble sort for doubles here. Okay, I have a bubble sort for doubles. And it's sorting a series of doubles as you see over here. Are we okay with this? So essentially, you know what this logic of bubble sort is, and this is uh, printing, as a bubble sort is uh, sorting the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the double values, and it's printing them out. Simple as that. OK? Now, question is, what if I want to sort anything? Why only a double? What can I do? The answer is pretty simple. Convert it to a template. If I look at this swap thingy over here, what are the important things, general things that need to change to make it to a template? It's the doubles, right? So I can write over here template, type name, 
uh, T, let's call it, okay? And then change all the doubles to T. So that's the swap. Can I just change the double in a sort and be done with it because I wrote a template over there? The answer is no. Every single template command statement that you write only affects the scope that is coming after, no matter how big that scope is. If you have only one line and a semicolon, it's only for that. If you have an open curly bracket with 5,000 lines of code, it's that. The scope that comes after, that's the only thing that is affecting it. If you want the bubble sort, so that's the swap that happened. If I want the bubble sort, I have to do the exact same thing for some bubble sort, saying template, type name, type. On purpose, I changed the name, oh. On purpose, I changed the name of the placeholder for the template. So you see, it doesn't matter what is the what is the name of the placeholder? You can put anything. So for this bubble sort, what do I need to change? This double, change to type. Should I change int to type? No, because it has nothing to do with the sort. You can sort five cars, five doubles, five buildings, five employees. It doesn't make any difference. Number is number. That will not change. Okay? And essentially, that becomes, my, that becomes my template. So if I want to make it a little more fancy, I can actually make it like that will do, but if I want to make it more fancy to show actually what it means, this is a temp uh, the exact same thing, but sorts, sorts in two different directions. You can go uh, ascending or descending. So it's essentially the same thing with an if statement to do the swap different ways. That's the same thing, no difference, okay? Just I want to show you that it could be more arguments and each argument work exactly like a regular function, but only the things you want to change from function to function, you convert it to, to a template with a placeholder. Are we okay with this? Now if I run this program, it works the exact same way. It's absolutely no difference, but of course, I call this sort, so, that the other one's bubble sort, so let's make that one sort, just for it to work with it. And if I run it, it works the exact same way now, and it actually sorts them. But if I want to use this sort everywhere, what do I need to do? I have to actually go to the header file, create a, a, a sort header file. So I have, a, a, it's a header file. So sort.h, now in sort.h I put all the good stuff that I do, so if not define, oh. if not define, uh, stds sort h, then I'm going to say define, I don't trust myself so I copy this and paste it over here. And then you have to bring the whole thing in here, not only the prototypes. Remember that. The whole thing should reside in there because it's a template. If you have a template, the whole thing must be in the header file. Remember, this is not a code. This is not a CPP code that creates conflict. It just tells the compiler how to create the function. That's all. Remember that. Okay? Now doing this, I have the sort in a header file and life is good. Pardon me? Yeah, it's right here. Sort.h. Right? Okay, so in here, oh, uh, you mean included? No, I didn't. So in here, I, I'm going to go include sort.h, and that'll be my sort, and it works exactly the same way. And let me see if I have a good example for it. Actually, I do. Uh, 
So let's, uh, so let's save this. Um, 0, 06 uh, template dot CPP. Okay, now I'm going to come back over here, but this time I'm going to bring something else. Copy. And paste. There you go. So, I have a class called car with all the information that I need. Operators overloaded and everything. Okay? I have another class called student. I have another class called employee. And I have array of those things sitting over here and an array of integer. I simply call the sort for all of them and automatically it's going to create the sort for different types for a car, for a student, for employee and it works for all of them perfectly. It's the exact good old sort that I have written and all I need to do but there is one thing that you need to do whenever you are creating a template you have to look closely to the requirements of your template. What are requirements of the template? Let's look at swap. What does swap need for everything to work? If you want to tell somebody, if you want to use my swap template, what specifications my class should have? It has to have copy constructor, because I'm saying t temp is equal to target of, so copy constructor should work for it. An assignment operator should work for it. So these are the documentation that you always add with your template. You look at your template and see what can you do. If you look at the template over here, the type T that has A over there, less than and greater than are being used with A, correct? Which means your object, whatever is using that template, should work with greater than and less than uh, operators. Otherwise, this won't work. So all these things have to get documented. And after it's documented, then uh, you can use it to, for whatever extent that you want with absolutely no problem. I got 55 errors. Oh, um, it's unsafe. Let me just fix that unsafe thingy. Oh, where is it? Consider using... Oh, there you go. I wanted that. For some reason, I could never memorize it. I don't know why. Every, because maybe I, every time I'm, co I'm co copying it instead of <laughs> actually. Uh, define. That's that one. I don't need this one. Okay, and run it one more time. Hopefully, it's going to work now. There you go. Now I have all these things created. So those are sorted by their license plate. These are sorted by employee numbers. And students are sorted by their student number, I think. No, by names? I don't know. Somehow they're sorted. With what? I don't know. Last name? First name, CFL. Yeah, so this is first name. This one is first name too. So they are sorted by their names. Anyways, and integers are sorted because they're integers, right? So you have to look at the code and see how we, how we actually define the less than and greater than operator, and then it works that way. Are we okay with that? Are we okay? All right. Next one. Oh, where is it? So let's put this one over here. 07. Did I have 07 already? No. 07 template. Save. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is this.
What happened? Um, oh, I need the header file too. Where is the header file? Oh, there you go. So I have a class called int array. And my integer array class, my integer array class simulates an integer array. Did we do this already in class? Did we do an integer class, uh, an array simulation? We didn't? Uh, OK, so here you go. You're doing it now. OK. So I have a class. I call it int array. An array is essentially a pointer pointing to a chunk of memory, right? So I'm doing that. I'm saying an integer array has an integer pointer amp data, right? And I'm saying that you have a size for that integer array, how many things you have. The reason I want to have this to fix the problem with arrays in C language, so I don't overwrite, I don't go this uh, past the size and uh, it crashes on me and stuff like that. So I don't want an array to be copied or uh, uh, so I, I delete it. I have a function that returns what the size is. I have a function that resizes an array, which means essentially it resizes an array. I showed you exactly how resizing is happening in a dynamic memory allocation. So it's doing that. I have a function called at that actually tells me, gives me the element at certain index. And I have an index operator that does the exact same thing. And I have a a destructor, if I can type virtual, virtual, OK, thank you. All right. And I have uh, a destructor that destroys the array. Um, and it's pretty straightforward in everything. So it's regular dynamic memory allocation, size returning M size, uh, resize, uh, literally uh, allocates memory, copies all the data, deletes the old data, and updates the pointer. Um, index at is very simple. It checks the index. If the index is greater than the size of the array, it resizes the array, then gives you the, the element. So you have no worries. You can exceed the size of the element, and our array would resize itself with your size. So you're fine with it. OK? And so on and so forth. So, and I have a delete that deletes the array, and so on. So this is just uh, uh, an integer array. And the integer array works perfectly with integers, obviously. And that's an example for it. Let me just add IO stream stuff to the top. And then I'm going to make my point in here what I want to actually talk about at this moment. I don't have an uh, uh, that one I don't have ICT anymore. And this is what we have. OK. Undeclared identifier. What's going on? Oh, int array. I think I have an int array i over here, right, that I missed. How did I copy this? Yeah, int array i. And I, the constructor of the array gets the size, so I'm going to put int array i. I don't know, five. So that creates five or integers. And, and then I have the array created. Assignment cannot happen. I'm going to remove that. OK, so that's what I have. A simple ex uh, example of how the array works, OK? And I'm not going to walk through this. The point that I want to make, an integer array is good for integers, correct? I want it to work for anything. So this is actually how you create templates. When you write a template, when you're a beginner, you're a newbie, what you do is first you create your logic for a primitive type. And then you convert it to a, to a template. How do we convert a, a class for a template? 
Classes for templates work like this. Now I'm going to just convert it and we'll see what happens. So you, it's the exact same thing. So template, template, type name, T. Okay, I have to change whatever is needed. And I'm lazy, I'm going to put that for every single scope. So I'm going to copy that, that's one template. Again, because the scope of the class ends over here, I know these are implementations for that class. But for every single scope, you have to add another template tag. Remember, a template only affects the next thing that comes after. So that's that one. And template for this one. And template for this one. And template for that one. Template for this one. And template for destructor. Now let's convert it. Rule of converting for classes. You convert all the relative type to your template to T, to the signature, except the name of the constructor, the name of the destructor, and let's go through it one by one as you see. So, when I create an integer array over here, okay, what do I do? Int data type, that's something that I need to change because I want it to be an array of something else, right? So I'm, let's actually change this control H. I'm going to say int array, change it to array now. Not, not int array, it's actually an array, right? So let's change everything like that. Okay, so that int becomes T, okay? In here, do I need to change this int? No, it's the size, who cares, right? The operator, size, size, this one is returning the element, correct? So that should be the type. And this one is returning the element too. That should be the type. I'm good. There is one problem over here though. Let's remove these for a second and just check something to explain to you something. I'm going to bring them back. So if this template is for my class, how the devil C++ is supposed to find out what is the type but lo by looking at line 23? Does line 23 have a signature, like a function? No. Functions, C++ can recognize from the signature. Oh, it's a function. Two integers are passed to it, so the placeholder is supposed to be an int, right? With a class, we don't have that one. Because we don't have that one, we have to add the signature ourselves manually, which means in here I have to put int. Oh, not like that. Sorry, 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 sorry. Int. By doing that, I'm telling to the compiler, array is a template. Create an integer out of it. Because classes don't have, classes don't have signature, we have to add the signature to it. Are we okay? Are we okay down to here? And because of that fact, at any place you have the name of the class, you have to add the tag to it so the compiler knows what are you talking about, which class you are talking about. So let's bring back the code, several attempts to write that integer, and come back over here. So, as I mentioned, the name of the constructor is an exception. You don't do it. But in here, I'm saying array is supposed to copy a class. Which class? I have to put the signature for it. Class of the same type. The name of the constructor doesn't do it. That's against the, the, the rules. In here, operator is returning an array. Which array? The array that belongs to T. And it's receiving a T. For the rest of them, 
I do, and the destructor doesn't change either. And another thing, so there are three exceptions. Any place you see the name of the class, any place you see the name of the class, you have to add the signature of the template to it, except the name that comes right after the template tag, that's line six. Any constructor name and the destructor name. These three exceptions. Anywhere else you see it, you have to put it. Let's go for the other one. In here, array. The first one is not a constructor name. It needs the tag. The second one is the constructor name. I don't touch it. Then I come into the code and I see if there is anything over here. Size, I don't care. Oh, I'm creating an array of integers. That's T. That's not integer. It's an array of T's, right? And I keep going like that for every single line of code that I have. And the result of the whole thing will be this. That's the magic of control C and control V. So essentially, I create a template out of my class. If I want this class to be used anywhere, the whole thing, class, methods, everything has to be copied into a header file. You cannot have it in a separate CPP file. And then, there you go. You have a class. And that answers your question for overloading stuff. You can create a class. Anything you do in a class, you can do it in a template. Absolutely no difference. OK? The good news is that that's not coming in exam. OK? The class is not coming, but the function will be there. We never had a final exam without a question about a function template. Function templates are going to, I don't know it's going to be there or not, but till now, down to this point, every single exam had one. You better study. Okay? Uh, and that's it. So I'll put all the working examples up. I'm going to upload all the working examples so you can actually execute and run it and see how they work. And I strongly suggest leave it for after the final exam. Check the template for the class. Next semester, 90% of the work you are doing are with templates. You need to know how they work. All right? Have yourself a beautiful day. Fuck it.